Hello, this is Holly Sanders, and this is a video lecture covering the efferent division of the peripheral nervous system. In this video, we are going to finish up the nervous system by looking at a couple of efferent pathways. But in review, let's look at an entire nervous system flowchart so we can see what we've covered already. First of all, the nervous system breaks into two major branches, the central nervous system, or CNS, which is comprised of the brain and the spinal cord, so be sure to go back and review the video lecture on the brain as well as your outline and brain diagrams. And then on the other side is the peripheral nervous system, which is how the nerves communicate with the central nervous system and then back to our muscles and glands. You may remember that inside the peripheral nervous system is comprised of two different groups of neurons, motor or efferent neurons and sensory or afferent neurons. Remember the acronym SAME, sensory, afferent, motor, efferent. So sensory neurons are what bring signals from our peripheral to our central nervous system, and then motor or efferent neurons are what sends messages to our muscles and glands in order to react upon that information. So today we're going to continue on the efferent or motor neuron pathway and discuss our two different types. One is called the somatic nervous system, and the other is the autonomic nervous system. As indicated here, the somatic nervous system controls our voluntary movement. And when you hear the term voluntary, I hope that it sparks a memory of a past lesson on muscles to remember that skeletal muscle is voluntary. And the autonomic nervous system controls our involuntary responses, which includes our cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, as well as our glands. So just think of autonomic, automatic, autonomic, automatic, somatic is skeletal muscle or voluntary movements. And then further, when you dissect the autonomic nervous system, we're going to come to two different types of reactions. One, to, one is called the sympathetic division that controls our fight or flight response versus our parasympathetic division, which is our rest and digest or R&R response. So just to look at this with a little more depth, our motor or efferent division, again, is broken into two subdivisions, our somatic nervous system, which controls our voluntary response, and our autonomic nervous system, which controls our involuntary response. Within our somatic nervous system, it's our voluntary response through our efferent or motor pathway of neurons. It controls our skeletal muscle. And if you remember back to the stages of an action potential where the nervous system meets the muscle cell or our neuromuscular junction, you may remember that it requires a neurotransmitter to move the stimulus across the synaptic cleft, and this neurotransmitter is ACH or acetylcholine. This is a review of what we did in the muscle system, so now all you have to add is the new term for our pathway to our skeletal muscle, which is called our somatic nervous system. Our autonomic nervous system controls our reflexes and involuntary muscles, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle. It controls our glands, which release our endocrine hormones as well as our exocrine responses. It also regulates our digestive system, blood pressure, urinary system, basically all of the smooth and involuntary responses that our body uses to maintain homeostasis. Within the autonomic nervous system, we have two subdivisions listed on the right-hand side, the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. Within our autonomic, which means automatic nervous system functioning, our parasympathetic division maintains our housekeeping or homeostatic activities. In fact, I imagine the majority of you are in parasympathetic nervous response right now. This is where we regulate our smooth muscles to do things like digest, defecate, diuresis, which is make urine, um, do things that maintains our necessary body function. The way I like to remember the parasympathetic division is basically our R&R. Everything is in rest, everything is working on maintaining homeostasis by digesting, by creating urine, getting rid of toxins, anything that needs to happen for a normal everyday health and homeostasis. Although there are several transmit neurotransmitters that help with these divisions, I want you to remember a main two. As we just reviewed, the somatic nervous system 
helps with our skeletal muscle, its neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. For our parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, the main neurotransmitter is called norepinephrine, and that helps regulate that smooth muscle. As well as maintaining our digestion and our homeostasis, one of the most important areas that the autonomic nervous system controls is the smooth muscle that's inside of our blood vessels. Now our blood vessels carry our oxygen and plasma and nutrients and everything that is inside our blood to all the cells of our body. But it can be controlled involuntarily because it's made of smooth muscle by our autonomic nervous system by either dilating or constricting. So when a blood vessel dilates, more blood can go to an area. When it's constricted, less blood goes to an area. This becomes very important in our autonomic functioning as far as our parasympathetic and sympathetic reactions. When the body is in a parasympathetic response, the blood vessels dilate to areas of our digestive system, our urinary system, our reproductive system, areas that need to regulate to maintain homeostasis. The more blood that's delivered, the better those cells will function as far as maintaining our homeostasis and, and giving us the ability to perform our necessary body functions. While it's dilated or more blood going to the digestive and urinary divisions, Blood to the brain and to our skeletal muscles is shunted because they're not being used as much. This is in contrast to our sympathetic or fight or flight autonomic system. Our sympathetic system is what maintains our homeostasis in a time of stress or unusual stimulus. So imagine if you were in a life-threatening situation all of the blood vessels, which are controlled by our autonomic nervous system because they are made of smooth muscle, will dilate to our skeletal muscle and brain. This will allow us to think faster. This will allow our responses to our skeletal muscles to get more oxygen, get more, which allows for more ATP creation so there can be more energy released. So in turn, while the blood vessels are dilating to our brain and our skeletal muscle, delivering them more blood, there is less blood being delivered to our areas such as our digestive system and our urinary system. When someone is in a sympathetic response or fight or flight response, it is supposed to be for a short-lived time and only in order to protect them from whatever is stimulating that response. In order for a sympathetic reaction to happen, during a synapse or when the neuron speaks to another neuron through an action potential, epinephrine is the main or most common neurotransmitter that is used to continuate that stimulus or si signal. Epinephrine is commonly referred to as adrenaline. And I know you've all heard of adrenaline. It is a hormone released by our adrenal glands, which sit on top of our kidneys, in order to allow us to go into this sympathetic reaction. So take a moment and just think of something that sends you into an adrenalized state and what happens to your body when it, when it does so. In review, we do have two efferent or motor neuron responses that are sent out from our brain or our spinal cord to respond to stimulus or things that, need, that the nervous system needs to regulate. One is called our somatic pathway, and its neurotransmitter is acetylcholine, and it helps fire skeletal muscles through that action potential that we studied. And the other is autonomic. This is where you can have a sympathetic, a fight or flight, or a parasympathetic, a rest or relax reaction. Sometimes acetylcholine is used, but I, what I really want you to know at this point is that normally in a sympathetic reaction, our neurotransmitter is epinephrine, and in a parasympathetic reaction, our normal or most common neurotransmitter is norepinephrine. So let's look back at this chart one more time. We're going to concentrate over here on the PNS, or peripheral nervous system, where we send messages to and from our CNS, or central nervous system. All messages enter our brain and spinal cord through sensory nerves, and you may remember from studying the cranial nerves that things like the optic nerve, or sensory for vision, olfactory nerve, sensory for smell, vestibule cochlear nerve, sensory for hearing and balance. 
versus motor neurons, which are sending signals out to our muscles and glands. If a motor neuron or an efferent neuron is sending a message to our skeletal muscle, which is voluntary, we call this the somatic nervous system or the somatic nervous pathway. If a motor neuron or an efferent neuron is sending a involuntary response, it goes to our autonomic nervous system, which controls our smooth muscle, our cardiac muscle, and our glands. Within this reaction of the autonomic nervous system, it can send a parasympathetic or rest and digest reaction that's going to maintain homeostasis, make sure the digestive system's functioning properly, urinary system's functioning properly. In this division, blood is shunted from our brain and our skeletal muscle, and it's kept in our in our core organs for those regulatory responses. Versus our sympathetic division, which is more rare, and that is in a time of extreme stimulus, where we go into a fight or flight reaction, and blood, through our blood vessels that are made of smooth muscle, blood is shunted from our digestive and urinary and regulatory systems and delivered through dilation of the blood vessels to our brain and our skeletal muscle. Lastly, I'd like for you to look at our somatic reflex arc. Please remember that the somatic nervous system controls our skeletal muscle response. But a reflex arc happens when there's a jerk reaction. I'm sure you've all been to the doctor where they hit you on the knee and your muscle jerks involuntarily. Now we all know that skeletal muscle is voluntary, but within a reflex arc, it does move involuntarily because of this very important loop. First, a sensory receptor, and you can see the sensory receptor here within the dermis of the skin, is going to have a stimulus applied. Imagine that you put your hand on a hot eye of the stove. It's going to first be received or felt through this sensory receptor. At that point, a very fast message through our neurons is sent through an afferent neuron that's step two to the spinal cord. The spinal cord is often referred to as the integration center, and this is the interneuron of the spinal cord that is recognizing the signal that something has become dangerous or harmful to the sensory receptor and before the message is even sent to the brain to be analyzed a response or a reflex is sent back out so it's sent back down an efferent neuron or motor pathway that's step four all the way to our skeletal muscle for a reaction that would be the effector organ in step five this circle or arc happens every time in an air in a This circle or arc happens in a protective type response. It is the only time our skeletal muscle should respond involuntarily. So there's a sense. So a sense is received through the sensory receptor, sent through the afferent neuron to the spinal cord at an integration center, where then a response is immediately sent out through the efferent neuron until it reaches the effector organ, which allows a involuntary contraction of skeletal muscle. While this arc is going on, the information is sent to the brain so it can analyze the situation. Although you've already removed your hand from that hot eye, the brain is then able to assess the situation. If you think about when you burn yourself, or if you think about if you stub a toe, how there's that moment of reaction and then you feel the pain, this would be the split second difference between the reflex arc and when the brain is able to actually feel the pain and analyze what's going on. Okay, that wraps up the nervous system. Be sure to go back and review all the parts of the brain and the spinal cord that we went over from, for the CNS, as well as review the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves for the PNS. Then consider the motor and sensory neurons and how the motor neurons break into two different nervous responses, the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. One final way to review and make sure that you have this is by completing your assignment on the ANS written assignment. This is due for a grade and it's going to ask you some questions to let you 
analyze and discover your knowledge on the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system.